Um, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this uh, class will be um, about content analysis. Uh, I'm uh, not alone. My name is uh, Lucia Bainotti, and uh, you already know me. I'm uh, a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam, and I'll be giving this class with my colleague and friend, uh, Ilir, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, as some of you might know, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Milan, and uh, we're here to talk to you a bit about digital content analysis. Ilir is going to share his screen and we can start. Yes. Can everybody see? Yes. 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 Yeah. So um, as Lucia mentioned, today we'll discuss a bit about digital content analysis. The structure of the class will be uh, structured as follows. In the beginning, we'll try to introduce a bit of general content, context and the general idea behind content analysis. And then we switch to more in-depth uh, considerations about both text and images. If you have any question, uh, please stop us and uh, ask them. There will also be uh, a small time at the end of the lecture in which we can uh, discuss and go over some of the things that might have been a bit uh, harder to grasp. So uh, I think the best, best place where to start is by considering what is content analysis. The idea behind content analysis is um, a way in which we can extract uh, actionable data from some data we have. In, at its heart, it's a way to quantify some aspects of the data they were interested in. Um, some of the um, some keynotes, uh, as I mentioned, um, we will discuss about both uh, textual content and images. And, this is because the text that you see mentioned here, it's more in a, a semiotic sense. That is, uh, it's a large and given definition of text. As we will see, uh, we, will not only, we can only, not only consider textual and image data, but basically everything. We could consider videos, we could consider a newspaper article, books, music albums, everything can be considered as long as it has some kind of meaning to derive from it or some kind of actionable data that we can extract from it. At, at its heart, as I mentioned, it's quantitative. So it leans on uh, a way to make sense of the data using numbers. We'll see in a bit what it means. Uh, but first I'd like to uh, make a quick and short example to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, simply put, uh, content analysis can be considered uh, a way to take a specific text, in this case, for example, a newspaper, interpret and quantify its content to draw insights based on this data that we have extracted. So for example, let's say we'd like to know um, to what extent some specific newspapers uh, are uh, Europe-centric. So we choose uh, our corpus, our collection of texts. In this case, we, we could, for example, consider all newspapers ever. Then we proceed to sample these newspapers. So we choose a smaller uh, subsample of those, for example, that are located in, let's say, um, Europe and the US, because our, our purpose might be to consider an uh, English-speaking newspaper. Then from this, we take the issues located in a specific month, and we go through all the articles. Every time the European Union or Europe is mentioned, we write yes. Every time it's not mentioned in an article, we write no. At the end, by compressing and collating all these data we extracted. So after coding every article in every newspaper that we're interested in, we can get some data that is actually useful to interpret. So we can see that, for example, uh, in these totally uh, invented numbers, the Financial Times mentions uh, European Union 66% 66 of the articles, when compared to the 10%, for example, in New York Times. So as you can see, by simply reading through the data and extracting a specific data that we're interested in, obviously this can be amplified and we can include several other layers that we will see, we can derive some specific insights about what we're interested in. In this case, this might be, for example, a ranking of uh, how uh, Europe-centric a newspaper is, of course, with all the uh, necessary methodological limitation of our case, but you get where I'm coming from. But this is not only a class about content analysis, it's a class about digital content analysis. This means not only focusing on digital data, but 
exploiting some of the characteristic, uh, characteristics of digital data to uh, aid our research, which can be to exploit it to collect data in a certain way, to subsample in a certain way, or to obtain more actionable insights on it, as we'll see in a bit. So uh, the first part, those digital data in general, it means that in, this, in the context of this class, we will cover mostly data that has been digitized or it's natively digital. Furthermore, um, considering digital methods, not, as I mentioned, not only means to act on this digital data, but means to exploit it. Let's say we want to go back to the research I mentioned before, it was about the, the centricity of you know, the European centricity of some specific newspapers. To do so, we can exploit social media platforms. So for example, we might interest in uh, how they present themselves on social media, these newspapers. So we might extract all the articles that are posted on Facebook, let's say. And this to some extent, in a way that can aid a lot in collecting our data. First of all, because it's to some extent already indexed. We can assume that if it's posted on Facebook, it has some meaning for newspapers. So it is a, either an important news or it follows their editorial logic for what pertains online content. Second of all, it's already there. It's already indexed. So we don't have to go and run through all the issues to collect our data, but we can automatically extract it and it should be already indexed. So uh, by index, I mean, it should already be categorized as an Excel file. As we will see, uh, one of the main ways to categorize text and one of the easiest is, for example, to consider every unit of our analysis as a row in an Excel file and every column as a data, metadata, or one of the topics we're interested in. Not, not particularly different from the two very small uh, tables that you're seeing here. So the strongest part of the digital methods, however, as we will see, is the ability to perform some operation of both data management and to exploit this uh, metadata. So this information that are not part of our data, but they kind of categorize it and index it. More, of this, more on this in a bit. Before going into how to analyze this data, how to extract these insights I was mentioning, I think it's useful to consider uh, two different general types of content analysis. Uh, but first note, this is not um, a strong division. It's a bit contested. In some ways, every kind of content analysis is quantitative since you're extracting numbers that you can use to, uh, you can, you can you know, convert in qualitative data into numbers to some extent. But I think it's still useful to distinguish these two dimensions, if not in a perfect taxonomy, in a conceptual way. You, you two heuristically make us understand a bit better how these approaches can vary uh, quite drastically. So, for example, in the quantitative context analysis, our effort is to count and measure something that's as systematic as and reliable and as valid and replicable as possible. What this means is quantitative context analysis relies on assigning specific rules, specific uh, ways to interpret the data. So let's say we want to analyze uh, Instagram selfies. Every time uh, a selfie includes a hat, we put one on our head category. Every time it has sunglasses, we put a zero. Uh, we put a one in the sunglasses category and so on to categorize, let's say, all the clothing that appears in selfies. As you can see, this is pretty easy to transform from one dimension to another. It's just a numeric values to a objective and precise component into our unit of analysis. In this case, hats or sunglasses. However, um, Quantitative content analysis relies on um, a bit more on nuances. So instead of focusing on counting and measuring in a strict way, it focuses, of course, in counting and quantifying and measuring these kind of aspects. But it it uh, applies and it puts more emphasis on interpretation, meaning, and practices. As you can see, it's not particularly different from a broader distinction between quantitative and qualitative. That's why it's such a powerful tool to explain these different approaches. Let's consider, for example, ethnographic content analysis, which is an approach that incorporates some elements of uh, more exquisite uh, ethnographic approaches to content analysis. So, for example, um, similar to uh, ethnographic approaches, uh, qualitative content analysis, um, ethnographic content analysis might leverage on, might be way more iterative. So we go in with an idea of what we want to collect but we kind of um, reiterate the data every time we notice that something kind of uh, makes sense, not to us, but to the uh, population we're studying. So let's say, let's return to selfies. Instead of categorizing it, the, the, what they're wearing, we, can, we might 
after going through the data, see and notice that some of these um, some of these um, objects that seem uh, close have some kind of meaning. So by going over, we realize that, for example, hats are used in a more formal context. They're used as step macro stages. We can work this inside and re-include in our categories, for example, to distinguish between, let's say, hats as simple clothing that has uh, maybe no meaning assigned to by who's wearing it, and hats that have a specific kind of meaning. So I don't know, let's think about um, the hats that um, the Queen's guards have. This is a symbolic, it is a symbolic object. It's not only an hat. I think, I hope you've been able to understand where I'm coming from and why I'm referring to this distinction. But I think it will become a bit clearer over the course of the, the, this explanation. Ilya. Yes. So, sorry, just as a clarification, you said ethnographic approach, uh, the, which one was more iterative? Was that the quantitative or the qualitative? The qualitative. Both qualitative. of them, yes, both of them start with categories usually. So you have an idea of what you're looking for in the data. But quantitative relies more on testing hypothesis based on the collected data. And that's it. Obviously, it's never as simple as it is, but hopefully you're uh, getting where you're going to come from. While qualitative content analysis relies on more interpretation, immersing emic categories, and this kind of more uh, qualitative oriented concepts. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's discuss a bit of about the, peculiar, the peculiarities that uh, content analysis has when including it in your research design. As you can see, the main components are the same. So we start with a research question, then we proceed to sample. As we will see, sample is not always necessary because we can include all the population, obviously, but especially more qualitative approaches, it might be not feasible or right away impossible. So we have a research question. We have our data set that has been sampled. Then we proceed to code it. As we will see, coding not intended as in building a website for your data, but intended as in choosing specific categories and assigning and declining these categories in things that are meaningful to you and identifying it and attaching it to your data. So for example, earlier we mentioned the mentioning or not of European Union in our newspaper articles, but more examples will come in a bit. After being, co after being coded, after having wrote and filled our Excel cells with a specific, con and the, with a specific concept that are useful to our analysis, we just proceed to count them. As before, we just counted the number of articles that featured the word Europeans, European words, European Union, and you use that, and we counted that, and that was part of our categorical analysis. Obviously, at the end, there's an interpretative part. This might vary in um, in how it is approached, but usually it's just to see uh, the relation to your categories and their presence to your theoretical framework and your research question. More on this in a bit. So I mentioned counting, but what can we actually count? Let's present some examples so that I think might clarify a bit what I'm talking about. Let's say um, <coughs> there are in general uh, four, three main areas. Obviously this is not completely inclusive, but I think it gives you a pretty strong idea. The first element is to count specific and discrete elements. So for example, words or visual elements. And this is just, uh, for example, the newspaper ex uh, example. In a bit, I'll make a bit some more examples I need to clarify the difference. We can consider themes, for example, topics. So for example, uh, what we're discussing about uh, when we have classes. So the, this one is on content analysis. The one before was on network analysis. And you just extract uh, themes, topics, and general categories that represent the content according to what you are interested in, not across, not usually general and fixed categories. And then we have dispositions. So we can we can count, for example, uh, emotion, feelings, sentiment, and how people react and feel towards certain things, both directly and indirectly. And small parenthesis, more on this difference between directly and indirectly in the second part of the lecture. So let's go back to our examples. We want to study um, gender bias in job offers and in, in general in the working place. Since we are digital scholars, we think about LinkedIn, which is kind of the natural choice. We want to study this kind of uh, topics. 
So to check the gender bias, we can simply do so by counting our elements. So for example, we can just pick all, all adjectives for engineers, let's say, and see how many times, if any, him or her is, um, is returned. This, of course, gives us a uh, basic idea about, uh, let's say, if engineer ads are 80% male and 20% female, there's already some kind of manifestation of gender slant. And we can actually pinpoint it with some kind of accuracy just by counting a specific thing. In this case, uh, the adjectives that precede, uh, for example, a job offer. Similarly, we can do uh, another kind of dissimilar analysis, for example, by seeing the different displays in image images present in specific ads, or for example, in the profile pictures of a specific, specific working class. And Obviously, this allows to, um, to give us a kind of basic level of analysis. So if we see that more males or more females are represented in the profile pictures, we can already say something about it. But then if we apply different levels of analysis, so for example, uh, we uh, include and we start considering what is represented. So for example, uh, males might have, uh, according to this paper, males present themselves as being more, uh, leaning more on the uh, on social stages. So the profile pictures reflect that. So they dress in a certain way, in certain environments. What for females, uh, different and at all, found that it's more focused on uh, conveying a specific kind of emotion. This, by the way, is also to some extent reflected in the descriptions. but. This is not what we're talking about, but I think it's useful to understand how just by measuring a specific concept, a specific thing, we can have an overview of the data that's usually pretty solid or even a complete analysis of our data. Let's go to our second example when considering themes. For example, uh, we're interested in seeing uh, some or uh, what people uh, think about when they discuss organic or biological food. So we go into a Facebook group that's focused on organic food, let's, let's say, and we see what dimensions are tapped upon by users in these groups. So for example, some may lean more on the healthy side, some more of the eco-sustainability, while there might be some discussion about uh, whether it is uh, more expensive or not than traditional forms of, uh, of food, and so on and so forth. And this kind of gives an idea, for example, of the complex symbolic dimensions that make up uh, they might make up some concept that on, on the surface level, it's very simple, but might reveal some uh, face of the, say facets of the data that are not so easily uh, seeable at the first glance. The third example is, uh, for example, to count disposition. Let's say we want to know how the reception of uh, our brand, let's say uh, uh, Campari is on Instagram. So we get all the pictures coded and tagged with the, hashtag, with the Campari hashtag. We go over them and we see what emotions are associated with them. We might find out that Campari is seen as a, as an happy drink, or maybe it's the choice for uh, being sad and reflexive on, uh, on the shore at night, for example. And these could, could give us, for example, actionable insights that we can adopt and use uh, for, as insights for our advertising plans, plans for example. Oops. Some, uh, some more examples, and uh, I'm going to spoil Game of Thrones for some of you. I know it's not probably digital data, but I think it's useful to see the complexity to which just by counting we can reach. So if you have yet to see or read Game of Thrones, just maybe don't read the graphs too in detail. So this is the, um, an analysis done by counting all the words that every single, that every main character in a Game of Thrones uh, TV show, TV series utters. Some of you that might be familiar uh, might notice how on the, the chart on the right already gives some very, very precise insights about who the characters are and what their uh, reaction is, how they see the world sometimes. So for example, some characters have the word kill as the top word, some as, as the word please. And if you know what I'm talking about, but even if you don't, you can see that the difference between these words, they're radically different, but they represent something underlying in our data. They, they kind of represent by just by counting the top word what our characters uh, is about. And this is not only to understand um, <clears throat> on a conceptual basis, but if we if we compare it, for example, just by seeing the frequency over a timeline, 
we can see how characters change. We can see their prominence. We can see uh, if they uh, die or not, when they appear. And this is a level of insights obtained just by measuring and counting they, uh, words without even knowing what those words are. This is useful because to some extent, uh, when we consider, uh, for example, um, digital data, this is similar to what we do. So we usually plot our data on a timeline and this kind of helps us in understanding where to go and do um, aimed analysis to understand what happens, for example, in the peaks, to give us contextual information, to have an overview of the data. And this is where I think that analysis of words that could be also hashtags are, are really strong in giving us a way to see our data at a glance, to give us contextual information and to pinpoint us into the direction of analysis that might be that might net us more actionable data. So let's shift a bit to, for example, counting visual elements. <clears throat> By getting all Instagram selfies that include a specific kind of champagne brand, we can understand how the differences in branding, in perception, in who uses it, in what social context, in what practices associated with it. Just by counting and normalizing and categorizing specific hard dimensions. So for example, we can see um, the, the kind of background we have, but we can see the, pres the number of sales that present the bottle. So how important the packaging is for the consumer of your brand. We can see how much wine glasses are associated. So specific modes of consumption. We can see how much uh, sociality is included in that rather than uh, just a, a display. Just by counting specific elements, we can arrive at a level of sophistication in our analysis that it might be deceiving. And you might not think that just by counting things that appear in an image, if you have the right categories, you can go really deep into what are your interests. And again, this is very useful because just by, for example, coding a sample of your images, you can have an idea of what your categories are and maybe go back and fix them but more on this later. So let's consider themes, for example. Uh, this analysis is taken from uh, Kalyandra Gandini's book. You might have heard of them. Um, in general, for example, um, we can codify tweets. We can type tweets based on the topics that we think uh, might be present. And then again, iterate and reiterate until we have actionable data. So let's think about it. Going into the idea of studying, for example, uh, veganism, one might think that the, one of the main purpose is animals and uh, plant-based diets. So maybe the ethical dimension, the activist dimension, but by coding and going over the data and having this iterative approach, this qualitatively iterative approach, we can arrive and we can see the different symbolic dimensions that make up veganism. Obviously, this is starting by our digital data. So let's maybe we should be careful about giving this extreme generalization, but I think it still makes a lot of sense about the data we're gonna find. And on the second note, you might notice that on the right, it mentions retweets. This is something, another strength of digital data that we can use the metadata or the data about the data we have to, to structure it in a different way. So for example, instead of coding every tweet, let's say we can conglomerate and code only those that have more than, uh, let's say, 10 retweets. Because retweets, we can assume as a measure of popularity of, of how uh, spread the contact is. And therefore, by coding this in some way, we can kind of see the, what the, the most shared, the most understood, the most uh, uh, condivisible, the, uh, the most um, shared among a specific social group what themes, what meanings they, as, uh, they ascribe to this dimension, for example. Similarly, uh, just to give you an example that some of us may be more familiar with, let's consider uh, the, the themes, the main themes that uh, took place in some specific political speeches by Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump during the 2016 US presidential elections. Just at a glance, you can see not only what themes are important for them, but you will be able, I think, with a good degree of certainty to place them, to place them on an ideological spectrum without even looking at the names. 
And this is the strength of this kind of analysis, the ability to extract data and how this data relates, of course, to broader concepts, to our broader idea, to our broader interest and research question. We mentioned these positions. One of the main analysis that well, deals with these positions is, of course, sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis, as mentioned, can be as uh, complex as considering a vast range of emotions. So happiness, sadness, uh, rage, fury, all these uh, subtle definitions, or it can be as simple as negative, positive, and neutral. And despite the simplicity that at the first glance, just coding like this might entail, we can already see that the data that it gives us, it's useful and it already says something about what we want to study. In this paper, um, the authors tried to um, consider the, the perception that uh, Turkish people have of Syrian people according, on, according to Twitter. So what they did is just decoded a sample of tweets and they found uh, on the left, on your left on the graph, that 85% of the opinion of Syrians in Turkey are negative. But one thing that is also interesting about this kind of analysis, as I mentioned, is how it can intertwine with timelines by taking two different points in time. So for example, one before and after our treatment, or in this case, a specific event, we can see how this perception change drastically. So it's the same kind of analysis just taken at two different times can give us actionable insights. Of course, this, this data can be aggregated. So we can have a broader um, sentiment analysis that concerns all of our data set. But of course, the bigger the data set, the more methodological artifacts we are somehow, some, in some way, inserting into the data. Because maybe you're measuring something that is not what is related to you, to, to your research interests. So by dividing time frames and comparing a, a simple tool as sentiment analysis, so categorizing every single piece of image or tweet that you have, and understanding if what they're talking about, they're talking about it negatively, positively, or in a neutral way, it's very actionable. We'll see a bit more on this later. So <clears throat> I mentioned a lot that you uh, should code and then count. Let's stop a bit on the coding procedure. Codings at large means attaching a set of descriptive labels or categories to the images. This means once we have, for example, stated what we're interested in, uh, for example, uh, if we go to our example, we're interested about uh, the themes in political speeches. What do we do is we decline our, our categories into something that's exhaustive. That is, it covers every category of the object we are interested in studying. It is not a good content analysis. It's for example, we go to these, uh, these topics and for example, we then discovered that both of the candidates talk about, for example, uh, work um, job policies for 50% of the times and it was not included. That obviously does not fit with our theoretical framework of our research question. Aside from being exhaustive, it, they have to be exclusive. It means they don't have to overlap. Obviously, if um, not only it must, might lead to conceptual muddiness, but it might, it might it makes it way more difficult to have this iterative process I was talking about in case you're doing something more ethnographic. Categories do not have to overlap. They have to consider exclusive dimensions separate from each other as much as possible. The third thing is that have to be enlightening. Let's say the categories we found have to have some interest of us. They have to be analytically useful. We can, it, we, if during the speeches we count how many times uh, a specific article was said by both parties, it's not really useful for our, for, our con for our context of analysis. Similarly, if we want to consider more qualitative approaches and more, uh, more categories leaning on interpretation and on meaning, those have to be, have to give us something as to let us know something about the data that's useful and that we wouldn't know otherwise or we know it and we want to test it on them. So let's in go. Your, uh, in yes. your story to interrupt, I think uh, Ali, Alice maybe has a question. Uh, yes, I didn't want to interrupt. 
so uh, if I may ask this question, I'm still a bit a little bit confused on the part uh, in relation with quantitative and qualitative content analysis, in the sense that, for example, uh, if I want to um, um, uh, concerning quantitative analysis, if I need to check for example, whether fashion brands talk about COVID and I can, for example, take the word COVID and analyze it on Instagram and then count whether the word appears or not within the, uh, within the text, for example. Whether if I do a qualitative analysis, it means that uh, I might, I need to read each part of the text and understand whether they are mentioning COVID, uh, even though they are not uh, clearly mentioning the word COVID, or uh, is it an, a wrong assumption? I don't know if it's clear my question, but I'm still a little bit confused on how, how to, to split uh, and set boundaries between qualitative and quantitative content analysis. So the, the, the example you made, it's kind of fitting, but I think it's more concerning about methodology as we will see in the next slide. So um, if you want, for example, uh, quantitative, uh, quantitative, tech, quantitative content analysis does not mean only taking one single word, for example, but you could have a list of words given by your previous research. So you might type COVID, coronavirus, vaccine, jab, and all the related words. You run it, you, you count it automatically, and you have an, uh, some content analysis. Uh, the second example you made, and this I think kind of fits well with what you're considering with. But for example, let's say you want to do the same analysis and lean on more qualitative methods. As you mentioned, you can go through the data and notice the things that maybe might not be, you wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. So for example, uh, you see that your brand maybe make references to waiting in line for, uh, for vaccinations without mentioning vaccination. If that fits your research design, this could become, for example, uh, something that your brand is talking about. I think the difference is a bit clearer when we consider something um, a bit more uh, related to modes of consumption and meaning that uh, those who, for, for example, take pictures attached to them. Uh, the next slide, I think, will be a bit, uh, will shed a bit more light on this. And if it's not clear also because we shall go over it, uh, images that kind of lend themselves a bit more to a consideration of the qualitative approaches. Uh, if not, we're here at the end of the class and uh, we can go into it a bit deeper. Thank you. So as I was mentioning, this is related to the question you just asked because coding does not always have to be manual. Um, a small note. Manual coding is still, as of today, the most valid. It's still the one that can not only tap into uh, specific dimensions that automated or semi-automated uh, methods of analysis will not get, but it's also the one that usually it's more on point on what we're trying to research. Obviously, machines don't have the idea of uh, works through statistics. They don't have the idea of considering the nuances that we are able to consider. Obviously, coding manually, so for example, looking at every med image and putting a, uh, a label, looking at every tweet and putting a label, it's, it's good, but it has some limitations. Obviously, it's very labor intensive, so it requires, it requires not only to, have, to be sampled, but uh, you can usually never consider in digital data whole population using manual methods. You understand that, for example, if you have to code 100,000 tweets, after the first 10,000, you might start to not feel so well. And this is where other methods, for example, can come to our aid. Obviously, as I mentioned, there are some, some kind of, um, they are less effective in deriving things that's a bit more subtle, subtle and are less easily uh, codifiable. However, they can be useful in giving a first pass on the data to then give it a second manual look. Or still, it can give, despite being less, press, less um, valid, they're still very powerful tools because they allow to draw inferences, not from a sample, but for your whole population. For example, some of you may, might have played with tools that cluster images based on the color. To some extent, it's a content analysis because if we were to add a label stating the main color next to every of our images, that would be automated. 
or for example, let's say topic modeling and statistical tool that finds associations between the data and then returns a label that loosely describes the topic. So you run it and you automatically add your text that has already been, uh, been coded. Or you can use, for example, uh, dictionaries. Let's say you want to do a sentiment analysis of 1 million tweets. You don't feel like going over 1 million tweets and code them manually. So what you do is you find a dictionary that is a collection of words, but not unlike the dictionaries uh, we usually call dictionary. So for example, uh, a dictionary applied to sentiment analysis as a list of words and a score assigned to them. So for example, happy is plus one, uh, joyful is plus two, elated is plus three. While negative words, for example, uh, sad is minus one, um, destroyed is minus two, and so on and so forth. You can then automatically make this model count the words that appear and assign a score. So for example, if a word is, a, if a tweet is, a, I really like um, my Nike shoes, automatically our dictionary would assign it a plus, a plus two score because of very nice let's say. Obviously, this is not different from somebody going over a tweet and saying, oh, he said they're very nice. It's positive. But it allows, as I mentioned, to extend to the whole population. Also, it might make some mistakes. As you might know, the internet has just a bit of irony and sarcasm going in there, much like this sentence. So it might be hard for an automated machine to say, hmm, uh, to see, for example, a picture of my bro new broken Nike shoes and text, mm, I really love my Nike shoes. Of course, it's not positive because the underlying text is my shoes, my expensive shoes exploded and you know I paid money for them. I'm not happy about it. Obviously, this is the trade-off. So you can have something that's more resource intensive, like automated uh, type of coding that relies more on, uh, for example, uh, hard coded uh, bits of information on you can have manual coding, which is more uh, more labor intensive, most valid, and can uh, provide something that's less, um, that's lower beneath the surface of our data. Also, there's a, a third category that's as of semi-automated, for example, classifiers. Again, these are kind of, uh, there are three, there are three uh, taxonomy that it's supposed to just give you an idea of the coordinates what we we're talking about. This is not meant to be exhaustive. This is not meant to be, to be the definitive guide you've ever seen, but it's very helpful in understanding the limitation, the strength of all these types of coding. So semi-automated um, coding works this way. Let's say you have a data set of 1 million tweets. You don't want to code all of them, but also what you're looking for as some nuances. And nobody has ever write, write, written, for example, um, a dictionary that can tell you whether your tweets are discussing about, uh, I don't know, uh, cups or glasses. So what you do is you manually code by your own every tweet to see if it's about uh, cups or glasses. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at making an example about uh, politics or economics. So you read your first tweet. Politics. The second tweet, mm, this is about economics. You do so for the first, let's say 1000. And then what you do is you feed what you've coded, you feed this into your computer. It becomes a model that can be used to extend the inferences that you made manually with your data to your whole population by using statistical methods. This is a bit more complicated, but I think it's important if any of you would like to use content analysis in a um, the more structured way to know that is. Um, these types of, of coding exist and might be very useful. I personally am using one for my dissertation, for example. So without further ado, let's go into some case studies. So for example, let's consider a, a way in which we can, do a, we can uh, go over a digital content analysis from Twitter data. The first step will be obviously to collect the data and by following the medium. So for example, we can collect all key, all data based on a specific keyword or a specific hashtag. As I mentioned, one of the, uh, the powerful tools that uh, digital content analysis allows to do is to exploit uh, metadata, to exploit the uh, data that is produced by users. So we can use an hashtag, for example, to collect a, a data set that not only is about something, but it's about something that has a very specific connotation. So for example, if we want data about a social movement, 
we can use, uh, I don't know, let's say Black Lives Matter, we can use uh, the hashtag BLM to gather all the topics about the movement, but we can also use the hashtag White Lives Matter to, to see how the opposite side, let's say, those who oppose the BLM movement, how they articulate their own uh, thoughts. So once we have our data, our digital data that is uh, full of text and all the metadata we might ever wonder, it's time to start by exploding the digital traces we have to index a sample and get an overview. So for example, let's say we have our whole Black Lives Matter uh, data set. What we want to do, we might want to do is to plot it over a timeline. So we see the evolution of the data, not unlike what you see uh, down here. So we see, for example, a peak in the data. I'll go back obviously to the, the other slide in a bit. We see a peak of the data and we, we can see that, for example, uh, around the data of a trial for a, a policeman accused of uh, murdering somebody, we can see an increase in tweets and we can decide to focus on that specific time frame. We delve into it and we notice that with our hashtag, there's another hashtag associated a lot which is, for example, fair trial, let's say. You can use this to subsample your, uh, to subsample your data and to start and having an explorative analysis. So we have our time frame according to this event that we identified using the data, and we can analyze all associated hashtags to get an idea of what they're talking about. And there will be more example on this later, so don't worry. Aside from this, we can, uh, as I mentioned before, for example, in the veganism, uh, example, we can use uh, uh, some metrics to aid us in our subsampling. So for example, we might want to, we were doing some manual analysis and we don't have the time to code all the tweets. We also know that for some reason, there's a lot of noise in our data. So for example, an hashtag is used a lot to, to spam, to promote its own content, and we don't really want to tap into that. So what we do is we subsample our data again using popularity metrics. So for example, using retweets, likes, or in general, what is called engagement. So let's say we have our uh, top 20% top of content for engagement, or we can set the threshold. Let's say all the tweets that have more than 10 retweets, are, um, we can say they're pretty popular and we can focus on that. So just by exploiting these digital traces, we can subsample and get an overview of what the data is about, relative events, what events are about, and start already with a very basic comparison with, with a kind of methodology that it's not particularly hard, nor resource intensive, nor time intensive. Of course, after having identified what we're interested in, having subsampled the data, and having had, for example, by counting the words or the hashtags, kind of an idea of what happens, we can start, for example, um, to code the topics in our analysis. So uh, we have our research questions. So for example, we can say, what themes are the most discussed on Twitter about the, um, the Ferguson protests, let's say. We take this as our framework and we decline it. So we start, for example, by thinking some of the tweets might be about racial equality, some about uh, uh, systematic, um, systematic ra uh, systemic racism, one might be about uh, the funding, uh, the police and so on and so forth. So we start our categories and we start coding. I suggest in, in the beginning to code a very small sample to just get an idea of the data and then to build up upon that to iteratively keep looking at the data and keep revising your category and keep looking at the data and keep revising your category until you have categories that correspond to the criteria that we mentioned before. And most of all, they make sense to you. They are analytically useful, they do not overlap and they make sense about the conversation. If, for example, by studying the protest, we find that 20% uh, of the topics are uh, mentioned Walmart, maybe we're not really interested in the fact that they mention Walmart, but they might be um, might be talking about something else. For example, they might talk about the disruptive effects of the protest to businesses. So after we have, um, after we've derived our categories and we have wrote a code book which describes in depth what our categories are about, we can start coding. And as I mentioned, it's an iterative process. Let's go a bit more in detail with a concrete example. This is, uh, comes from my uh, MA thesis. 
that was about uh, vaccination and legislative effects on opinion on, of vaccine of uh, vaccine laws. Um, despite my thesis being uh, quite a bit of time ago, uh, vaccination are uh, sadly still relevant in uh, today's society. So let's see how I've done. At first, I collected all the, the tweets with the word vaccine. Then, as I mentioned, I plotted it and I got an overview of the data. I'm pretty sure you'd be able to, uh, to focus to see what the main uh, topic I was interested in at the time, that is a specific decree law, uh, you can see, kind of see where it is because there's a strong peak on it. So for example, what we can do is we can subsample the data. And if I want to see the effect of this specific event on my conversation, what I can do is to take a time before this peak and a time after this peak and code them separately and then compare them. Not, not particularly similar to what we've seen before, about uh, Turkey and Syria and opinions on Twitter. Obviously, uh, research designs need, can and should be more competent than this, but I think this example is pretty useful. Uh, we can, for example, find a peak and then the, the off-peak days before the events were interesting took place. And then we can, for example, choose other peaks and other off-peaks to act some, as a sort of control for our, uh, our conclusions. Because if the same topics are before and after, they might, that might mean that might mean that there is no effect at all, or it just might mean that these things go in a cyclical way. And what happens just amplifies the latent themes in our data set. So we've, let's focus on these three time periods, for example. And we plot hashtags. Just by plotting the frequency of our hashtags, we can already see that there's an idea behind what we're doing. So we can see the most popular one is M5S, which is the acronym of uh, Five Star Movement, a political party in Italy. We can see Lorenzin, which is the name of the minister that proposed the decree. There's a word decree that is pretty straightforward. And there's a word measles. And then school, freedom of choice and all this. This already points us to the fact that a conversation about vaccination in this context, it's very, very, very politically slanted. If we were to repeat the same analysis today, just the associated hashtag would paint a completely different picture as it will probably focus on different aspects. So just by looking at this, just by looking at, uh, at the peaks and what the peaks are for and the frequency of hashtags, we can already have an idea about what categories we might use in our uh, analysis. So we noticed that uh, some of the uh, dimensions that might be uh, prevalent are the political one and the health related one because of measles and autism and all in general uh, vaccination <coughs> context. Also, we know that for our long literature review that um, the uh, vaccination is, uh, uh, is a, to a specific topic that has kind of a polarization about uh, those who oppose, who are hesitant about vaccination and those who some extent, to some extent trust institutions and kind of go along with it. It's a bit more complex than this, but I think you get the idea. So we devise our categories. So for example, we're interested in this case about who is talking about our vaccine, our, uh, what, what's, who's talking about vaccination? Because if we know that it's a strongly political issue, we may, might want to filter political actors to not have um, kind of an idea that's slanted towards political elites rather than uh, citizens. Then we might be interested in knowing if uh, a spe every specific tweet is pro or against vaccination. And then we might want to check whether when vaccination is discussed is either using a political frame. So for example, uh, vaccination is being forced to us uh, because this party, uh, because I don't know, the Democratic Party wants to take to strip our freedom away. Or uh, those who oppose vaccination are because uh, they just follow blindly what uh, this other political party says. Or they might be health related. So for example, uh, we have to vaccinate because otherwise we won't reach the herd effect that will uh, uh, save some of the most vulnerable uh, areas of the population. The important part is once we have an idea of what we're interested in, we have to write a detailed code book. A code book is something, you will see a bit more about this and a good example of it with Lucia, but at its core, a code book simply describes what we are, what categories we're categories and subcategories we're talking about and how we're talking about it. 
I said subcategories because, for example, we can have uh, our broad political category, and then we can have subcategories, for example, that focus on policies or uh, uh, geopolitical relations. These are just some examples, absolutely uh, random. And um, or similarly, we want we might want to define which specific actor we are considering as political. Only those who are elected in the, in the parliament, only those who are part of one of the main parties, and so on and so forth. After we have our code book, we can just start by analyzing our uh, our tweets, for example. So we start coding and we code. And we noticed that hmm, our frame, uh, all the categories seem to kind of work, but our frame categories did not include an economic frame. So for example, we should vaccinate because otherwise the economy will never start. And as you might, have, you might imagine, this could be relevant in our analysis of how uh, the specific arguments are framed. So what we do is we go back, we include in our code book, the economics frame, economics category of our frame top, for our frame category. And we expand on this. Economics is all the all the suite that refer to the economical dimensions of vaccination, for example, lockdown, opening, and so on and so forth. We go over to it again and we code it until we are fully satisfied with what we have. On the bottom, I've included a screenshot of how physical it will look if you were to code your own content. This obviously works for, um, is for about Twitter, but we can extend it to everyone. For example, when uh, me and uh, Julia that you meet tomorrow coded some memes, we use the same Excel sheet. Instead of text, there was a link to the image. So the Excel, it's the main tool that you need to code manually. So we take our row, each row corresponds to, for example, a tweet with its own data. So favorite retweets, author and creation and date. And then starting from column I, we start putting the categories we're interested in. So we're interested in the type of actor, we're interested in the sentiment of the tweet, and we're interested in the frame of the tweet. And then we fill out manually all of these categories based on the interest we have. So for example, the first tweet, it's, uh, it's made by Matteo Renzi. We go and check on Twitter, maybe, uh, Matteo Renzi's profile. We see, oh, this looks like a politician and the actor is political. Then we read the sentiment and it's like, uh, we speak doctors and science. So it's, it kind of looks like it's positive. It has a positive attitude toward vaccinations at large. And then we see, uh, not the paranoia of aspiring leaders. Hmm, this sounds political because it mentioned leader in a way to frame a tweet. So we put politics. Also, as you might have noticed, there's a fourth column that I didn't mention that is called note. Notes is the most important uh, column in your data. In notes, you should put everything. For example, I mentioned the ad adding uh, economics category. If you think that uh, economics is something that is featured a lot, you might want to, to write in the note economics. Then after a while, you see, oh, I noted a lot of economics. Perhaps I should go back and consider it. Or you see lots of people, for example, in the first row, measure statistics. Hmm, maybe the data-driven could be a subcategory of health. And you do this process. And I advise you to use the notes as they were free, because they are. So write more notes as you can, the more the better, because when you go looking at the data, especially with ethnographic approaches, you might have feelings, you might have sensations, you might have interpretations that might not or might or might not correspond to reality, but you can, you need to be able to track them and you need to be able to consider them, to iterate and to add solid validity and strength to your analysis. Uh, one last thing, you might have noticed that um, not all the three categories we're considering, not all the three types of analysis we're considering refer to the same thing. This is important because we have to distinguish between what we, are, we have to be clear about what we are analyzing. So for example, in this case, actor is clearly an analysis of the screen name. And this is something that you have to be clear before going at it. For example, you know, we know that actor refers to author screen name, for example, while sentiment and frame correspond to the tweet. And again, if we're entering sentiment, what are we interested in? Are we interested in the sentiment of the tweet or in something else? 
This is important because especially with more complicated analysis, this level can refer and mention each other. So maybe you are coding the tweet and then a category makes reference to a category you've already made, like in subcategories. So it's important to have clear what every category is referring to, what, if you, what its unit of analysis is. So, for example, we follow that procedure and we have arrived to some of our conclusions, for example. And I think this is also useful to note how these kind of levels of analysis that can mix and match and we can further subsample and analyze what we are interested in. So for example, let's say uh, we're running a topic analysis. We consider all our tweets and how they frame the issue. But then we might think, hmm, this is interesting. Lots of people talk about uh, the political aspect of it, but how do they talk about it? Because maybe you think that the political frame is used by those who are, uh, who are favorable to vaccination, where the health dimension is used by those who are against it. So what you do is you break down further your analysis, you combine them and you see, for example, on the right, a sentiment analysis restricted to the tweets that had a political frame of the issue. And this can be used to obviously combine with all this level of analysis and with the timeline to have a very fine granularity that is very useful into addressing your research questions. So for example, in this case, our conclusion could be um, those who, are, who favor the analysis tend to be associated to, uh, to use political framing to distinguish the thing because they might have, um, because I don't know, maybe they see, and this could be a hunch to go and analyze further because they might see institution as trustworthy. So they might base their decisions based on what they see as uh, institutional. So for example, as political, while those who might be uh, health related, they might be more against vaccination because they might focus more on uh, a bottom up kind of knowledge uh, and so they might lean less on institutions and institutional actors and more on uh, word of mouth between the same users. So now uh, I've gone over a bit of uh, analysis in tweets and now I'll leave the word to uh, Lucia that will go a bit deeper into uh, how to structure this kind of analysis using images. Okay, thank you, Larry. Elir, are you going to switch the slides for me or shall we? Uh... Uh, as you wish. Uh, yeah, you can do that for me, thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, uh, the second part of this class is going to be more about uh, uh, visual content analysis. And as we said at the very beginning, we can uh, count and analyze uh, different uh, themes and different uh, topics. And one of the elements that we can count is actually visual content. Uh, in this uh, uh, class, I would like to focus on uh, two approaches in which we can analyze the visual content. And one is more uh, related to the visual attributes analysis. So um, that is much more aimed to collect and compare a large number of, of images. And the second one is uh, uh, visual content analysis that is uh, uh, drawing more on the uh, qualitative uh, uh, research tradition. And we will see how we can blend this qualitative approach with the, uh, the digital method uh, approach. Okay, so uh, in the next slide, we start with uh, this uh, first approach that is about uh, uh, analyzing and understanding the visual attributes of, uh, of images with a specific tool that is called uh, uh, Image Sorter. Okay, this is an, a browsing application that is uh, designed to sort images on the basis of different uh, characteristics such as color, name, uh, the size of the picture itself, uh, or the date taken. In the next slide, we uh, can see an example of uh, how uh, image sorter uh, looks like. And so it is basically a blackboard where you can upload all your, um, the corpus of all your images and they will be sorted uh, such as in this case by color. And this is an example from the very brand new and just published article by uh, Alessandro Cagliandro and Guido Anselmi that uh, is just in time for, for this class. 
And so here we can see uh, visually how different uh, images are in a way uh, combined and what are the patterns uh, of different images in a big data set. And uh, in the next slide, we can see that if uh, we uh, zoom in, so this is a, a browser application, so we can zoom in and uh, try to see uh, more in depth of what it, is, what it is in a specific cluster of images assorted, for example, by color. And here there is exactly uh, a visualization of what happens when we uh, actually zoom in. And we can see uh, how, for example, different um, visual uh, attributes uh, in terms of colors also correspond to uh, different practices of sub-presentation, in this case, for example, in relation to the brand Zera. So in uh, the first uh, uh, screenshot that you can see, there is this aesthetics that is um, related to black and white and um, and the, the uh, aesthetic that is related to the scholars is uh, an idea of uh, selfies and mirror selfies specifically that are uh, related to users' self-presentation in relation to, to brands. Uh, and so mm, this idea of uh, using image sorter uh, and doing these visual attributes analysis can be a, a very first way to start uh, your visual analysis and to have an idea of what's in uh, the data set and uh, what are the, the main characteristics of, uh, of the pictures that you have. And you can already uh, start, uh, in the, uh, start finding some clusters that can be uh, qualitative analyzed. So for example, uh, cluster one in this slide, uh, can be considered as uh, mirror selfies, for example. Uh, the uh, second cluster could be something like the display of an object, uh, which is very much uh, related to showing an object directly and uh, in, at the very center of, uh, of the picture. If you, uh, either you could go back to uh, the initial slide about image sorter, the first, yes, thank you. So we can use this uh, program to see uh, very different things. And so we can use, uh, uh, we can use it for visual similarities. Um, we can use it, uh, we can, for example, analyze if there is some uh, dominant images. So whether uh, an image is, is an image is uh, uh, recurring in uh, the data set we have and is maybe prominent or mo more prominent as compared to others. Um, and we can also use this kind of tool to analyze uh, image trends. So as uh, we have seen in the case of brands, we can use these uh, to see uh, patterns and repetitions of a specific themes in, uh, in different times and different spaces. And this is also why it can be a useful tool to compare different um, visual representations across platform. So we can make uh, an image board with the image sorter by looking, for example, at all the selfies on Instagram. And then maybe we can do a similar mood board, mood board using, for example, another platform and see, for example, Tumblr and see whether there is a, there are similarities or differences among the representation across platform. And this is uh, this idea of cross platform is uh, something that you will uh, delve deeper tomorrow uh, with uh, with Julia. Another thing that is uh, interesting to do uh, with uh, image sorter is to um, sort images not according to their colors or similarities, but in chronological order. This is an option that you can select. And this also allows you to see the evolution of uh, a visual discourse uh, uh, in time. And so this is, of course, not uh, strictly related to uh, content analysis per se, as we described it uh, so far. But this is, uh, let's say, uh, an interesting tool to use to to maybe have a preliminary visual analysis of your data. And maybe to um, you can use this tool 
to start having an idea of what are the categories uh, that you can implement to really coding uh, your, um, your, your corpus of visual data. Also because sometimes uh, it is, I mean, it can be quite straightforward to analyze visual data and so images and photographs and other visual text, but sometimes it's, it can be really hard and that's something I struggled with, for example, at the beginning of my dissertation, because when you want to grasp the meaning of the picture or when you want to grasp an interpretation of a corpus of a data, uh, it is actually much more complex than it seems. Um, so this is like the first approach that you can use to make sense of, uh, of um, visual uh, elements. And I would like to, to move to the uh, next uh, slide, this one, thank you, to give you a little tip to collect uh, your images from a data set. Uh, because probably as you have seen in these days, and especially for those of you who work or, were, or would like to work with Instagram, uh, images in a data set, so in a, for example, a, a, an Instagram data set, are presented in the form of links. So to access those images, you have to click on them and then maybe take a screenshot. And of course, it can be quite time consuming if you want to perform an analysis with a, a big data set, okay? So this is a, um, a little tip to collect uh, images more easily. Uh, it is a Google Chrome extension that is called Tab, uh, tab Save. Uh, and it is uh, very intuitive and uh, very uh, or easy to use. Uh, you just click on the icon of uh, the um, extension and you can then enter the uh, images links and download them uh, onto uh, your, uh, your laptop. Um, and this is a really uh, very helpful if you, you are not, if you want to collect images but you don't have them, okay? Because for example, for example, uh, collecting data uh, with Instagram, you don't have the images themselves now. So the only way to access them is uh, to use uh, the, the links provided in the data set. And the same goes if you want to um, collect some images from Google images as well, you can also uh, put the links there and download them. So this can be really, really useful for you to have your data collected. Um, and yes, um, again, it is always um, useful to keep in mind what are the data you intend to collect and what is the corpus you want to collect your data to avoid uh, downloaded, I don't know, 10,000 images on, on your laptop, because I don't know, sometimes it can be also like a little bit confusing. Okay, so this is a, a very, uh, I mean, a very handy and uh, interesting uh, extension. And just uh, remember that uh, as, all, as uh, all the things that we are using here in this uh, summer school, you have to think about the research design first and then use it, okay. So um, this was like the, 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 the first approach uh, to analyze the visual data. The second, um, the second approach that can be in a way complementary to the first one, and I would suggest that if you were to do a visual analysis, um, the second approach I was saying is visual content analysis. And uh, to uh, explain you something about this, I will um, um, talk about our work on Instagram stories, okay? So uh, as I was saying, uh, visual content analysis is, uh, let's say, uh, an analysis technique that derives from uh, qualitative research and can be used in combination with the digital methods as we did in this case. So the analysis of uh, Instagram stories that we performed is based on a very, um, on a method that we uh, friendly uh, call scraping and coding because we tried to scrape the content and then we of course coded it. Um, 
as uh, you probably remember from yesterday class, in this uh, specific um, research, uh, we um, aimed at following the users, okay? So we uh, use the digital methods as an entry point to get data about users. And then we followed them um, in a, a week time and we used this uh, scraper tool um, to collect uh, the corpus of data, our corpus of, uh, of visual data. So again, the digital methods as a perspective can be used as we have seen at the beginning as a way to approach, uh, select and manage data in the first place. And then can be far, the analysis can be further um, extended by using more qualitative analysis, okay? Um, something about the specificity of the visual analysis that we performed uh, in the next slide, and that can maybe be also um, useful for uh, for you, Ilya. Please, can you turn the slide? Yeah, thank you. So um, here we can say that the uh, approach that we used to the visual analysis is uh, what is called the ethnographic coding approach. So uh, this was what uh, Ilya was talking at the very beginning of the class. And here we are talking again about the distinction between uh, qualitative and quantitative content analysis. And I hope that maybe this example will help you to, to clarify this even more. So we basically uh, use this approach um, to uh, count and interpreting the visual elements of Instagram stories. And specifically, the analysis was the, uh, structured at the two different levels. The first one was uh, the denotative level. So we basically looked at uh, the visual content of uh, the, each Instagram story. And uh, by denotative content, uh, I mean um, what you really can see, the elements that you really can see in the images at first glance. Okay, so it is uh, the, the visual elements that we can immediately see in a picture, okay? Uh, the second level of analysis instead was the connotative level. And in this sense, uh, this is related to understanding the, um, the actual meanings or uh, a possible interpretation that is uh, behind a visual content. So if you wish, this uh, connotative level is a, a deeper uh, level of analysis that is aimed at really uh, interpreting the images uh, from a, a qualitative perspective. And this is also um, one of the strengths of uh, qualitative analysis, uh, of qualitative content analysis, sorry, because we can count elements and then we can also in a way interpret them and try to understand the meanings or at least to the interpretation of the visual content. And in the specific case of, uh, of our work, um, we um, tried to focus more on the context of use of Instagram stories. So in which occasions they are used and was, what this entails in terms of interpretation. And also what are the, the grammars that uh, um, characterize the uh, Instagram stories. So uh, by grammars, we mean the different uh, specific uh, visual um, patterns that are to be found there and that can be used in the different occasions, for example. Um, so uh, in the next slide, I will give you uh, another example of uh, the codebook that we actually used for uh, the uh, visual analysis. And as you can see, uh, we have, this is like the very, the very own uh, code book that, uh, that we used. And as you can see here, we have a general category. Um, uh, I have selected just uh, some, uh, just to, to, to give an example. Uh, so in category, we have a portrait, we have that are um, related to what we can see as a selfie and maybe related to friends and family. So for each category, that is the general box, we have a set of codes that in a way describe the category in a more specific way. 
And then we have a description of uh, the uh, category itself um, uh, so that we uh, can be sure that we categorize all of the, the stories in a in a similar way. And also if uh, other person were to uh, you know, work with us, we can be accountable in our analysis procedure. And then for each, uh, for each uh, uh, category and codes, there is an example of a typical um, of a typical uh, story that is uh, um, that represents that uh, category. Oops, sorry. Uh, this uh, first box uh, in the portrait category is uh, um, empty because it allows me to to stress that in the context of visual images and specifically of Instagram stories, it's also very much important to consider the ethical issues of the research. So we are addressing visual images that in most, in most of the cases, or at least in many cases, do have uh, people represented in them. And although the data that we collect are already public because we can say that they are on social media, so they are there, we have to pay uh, really uh, attention to uh, maintain user privacy. And so it is always a, be, uh, a good practice to anonymize data. Uh, and so it's specifically with images containing uh, human beings, this can be done uh, by obscuring, for example, the face and other recognizable elements in the picture. Uh, in this case, I deliberately chose not to show any example because this is quite a sensitive data. It is like Instagram stories. We collected them, uh, of course, with all the ethical uh, concerns in mind, but it was just a reminder for you to, uh, to, to, to also consider this uh, aspect when you, when you work with, uh, with the data in general and specifically with, uh, with uh, uh, visual data. Okay. Um, so this was about like the, 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 the coding, so how to practically uh, do that and how to create a code book uh, uh, for you to orient yourself in, in the data set and to be accountable for, for the analysis itself. And if we move to the next slide, we can see uh, the result of these uh, first uh, visual analysis. Um, I see a question in the um, in the, uh, the chat. Uh, Margarita, would you mind if I answer at the end of the? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I was saying uh, visual content analysis. So uh, the the notative uh, level of analysis, and here we really. Uh, counted and accounted for the what we could see in uh, in the pictures, and we can see that not uh, uh, surprisingly, the most recurrent category of uh, of uh, stories are portraits, which uh, represent uh, selfies and the friend and the friends or family. Um, the second one is, I think, one of the most interesting one because this category composition uh, was understood as a way of creating some um, visual elements that are not really photographs, but they are more uh, just a position of different visual elements such as uh, text, images, and also interactive stickers. That is a specific affordance of Instagram stories. So the possibilities, you know, to add um, slides, stickers, or to add music and something like that. And this was like a peculiar um, category of analysis that is uh, peculiar indeed of uh, Instagram stories as compared to uh, Instagram posts, for example. And then you can see the other categories uh, that uh, we uh, found in uh, the um, in uh, the uh, visual analysis of the visual elements that we can see at first glance. Okay. Um, as I said, this was uh, the presentation of the results. So, okay, we presented the result in this form of table, but then of course we tried to, you know, make this reasoning that I'm 
uh, actually giving to you uh, to make sense of these numbers because the numbers themselves do not talk that much. Okay, so a qualitative content analysis is also a way of interpreting this data uh, in a, trying to really uh, grasp the context and account for the practices and the users' practices and try to uh, put ourselves in, them, in their shoes and try to give uh, depth to these numbers. Okay, this is probably a way to, 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 to delve deeper into this idea of uh, qualitative content analysis. And to continue with this, um, um, the second step of the research was actually to um, delve deeper into the connotative level. And so we uh, try to understand when uh, and in which occas occasions Instagram stories are used. And again, uh, not uh, very much surprisingly, we understood that uh, uh, the um, most uh, recurrent uh, context of use uh, is the uh, special event. So again, and then of course there is the daily life, and then there is this idea of mood. So we also found that many Instagram stories actually are used uh, as way to express the one's feeling, uh, what is uh, uh, happening in the moment, but not in the sense like, okay, I'm reporting what I'm doing, but more like, okay, now I I'm feeling bored, okay? So this is also something that we found uh, in the analysis. And another interesting category is the one of interaction. So um, another interesting context of use was the idea of using Instagram stories to create interaction with other users. So despite we focused on regular users and not influencers, we saw that some of them used some tactics such as the question box, you know, uh, of Instagram stories. So some stickers provided by the Instagram's affordance themselves to create a sort of interaction with other users. And this is a good example of a, of a category of and how to interpret a, a category, because this allows us to say, OK, uh, differently from Instagram posts, um, Instagram stories uh, allows users to create uh, this flow of communication and this flow of, com of communication that we don't know if, we, uh, they, if uh, they do receive uh, answers back, but that there is an attempt at least to create uh, this flow of, com of communication that is also allowed in a way um, by the Instagram affordances themselves. And this is another way of interpreting this uh, category that you can see here as a line uh, and a, as a label and as a number, okay? Uh, in the very last uh, uh, slide, we tried uh, to understand uh, uh, this idea of grammars. So the idea was to combine the visual elements and the context of use to see uh, whether there were some um, uh, to see um, to see what are the visual elements used in each context. Okay, so for example, we saw that uh, for the context of use of special special event, uh, the most uh, uh, recurring uh, visual elements are portraits. So we can see that in uh, well, when representing special events, users uh, usually um, display their themselves or their family and the, and their friends, and this makes sense, right? Um, and the same goes for for daily life. Here, the main recurrent category is the one of materiality. So we saw that uh, the users usually de uh, describe their daily life by using um, the objects that are around us, uh, around them. Sorry. Okay. And to, to just uh, uh, mention another example, that is this idea of interaction that is uh, interesting, as I, as I said before. Uh, so interaction, again, is the idea of connecting to the audience and try to create a flow of communication. Uh, and here we can see that uh, uh, the most recurrent category of uh, um, visual content is uh, the composition that I described to you before. So the composition is the mix of text and stickers and memes and stuff like that. So in this idea of communicating and interacting um, 
with other users, uh, there are also um, other forms rather than images that are um, used um, for, for this aim. And so this was, again, a way to combine uh, the coding, so counting, you can see numbers here, but this was most important uh, uh, for us to really grasp uh, how users construct their visual communications and how they use different grammars across different contexts. And also we tried to relate to do to these to uh, Instagram posts, so to, to really understand the specificity of Instagram um, of Instagram stories um, with uh, um, uh, as compared to Instagram posts. Okay. Um, this is uh, what I wanted to say. There is something else that I want to add, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's it just it just occurred to my mind when we were talking. Um, and so I will uh, just uh, add it. And there is no slide, I'm sorry for that. Um, but um, as you can see here, we are mostly focusing on, on images and on Instagram stories in this specific case. But for, for other kinds of visual data, um, I visual analysis can also be combined with other forms of uh, content analysis. And this is really important uh, to, you know, when you have it at your disposal to combine uh, the visual element with uh, the textual element. So for example, to uh, use, uh, for example, Instagram captions to really uh, help you uh, understanding the content of the image. Okay, so I really uh, advise you to uh, integrate uh, uh, as much as possible the visual analysis and also take into account the, the textual elements uh, that you might have in a, in your data set or in your corpus of data. Okay. So this was uh, the, the last uh, part of the presentation. And yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for your attention. I, um, I'm yeah. uh, sorry, Lucia, I'd like to add something real quick. Um, the first of all, the first thing is <clears throat> to try to balance categories also based on occurrences. You don't want to have 10 categories at 1% and you don't want to have one category to 70% or 60%. So, you, you even if it's something qualitative, so you need first to understand what your what categories are using and the use there are few also consider occurrences and the percentages. And last thing, all of these analysis, they can be done using Excel. You don't need an incredible tool. Please, if you take away one thing from this summer school, let it be pivot tables on Excel. <laughs> Sorry, and thank you. Okay, uh, maybe I can just ask uh, uh, Margarita's question immediately. Um, how did you select the users that you followed for the research? Um, we did uh, an iterative approach again. Um, actually, we started, the main point was, okay, how do we select the users in a, let's say, neutral way? Because we wanted to focus on regular users, and we don't, and we wanted not to be, I wouldn't say biased, but at least we wanted a neutral way to to get our data. So we said, okay, let's use digital methods. Uh, we started by uh, collecting a data set of uh, of Instagram data by using the hashtag happy, so a very general hashtag and a neutral one. So we didn't look for a contested hashtag such as, I don't know, uh, Black Lives Matter, which can be, um, which can be uh, leading to opinions or feelings or something like, like uh, something like that. So we chose a neutral hashtag, Epi. We downloaded, uh, we, yeah, we scraped actually uh, a, a large data set. And from there, we selected uh, randomly um, 10 users. And of course, we had some criteria to really select uh, um, regular users. So, for example, the number of followers, uh, we excluded both bots, uh, we excluded um, general pages, uh, we excluded uh, influencers, uh, etc. So, randomly, okay, this one, is it okay with our, uh, is it a regular user? Yes, okay, it will be included in the sample. The second random user, is it uh, is he or she okay with uh, our criteria? Okay, 
let's uh, add it in the sample and something like that. So it was very iterative. And again, it was possible by starting with uh, a digital method approach. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry, just uh, one uh, last thing. Were these users, uh, uh, did you find some, uh, some connection between this user? Like uh, if you try to apply the network analysis, did you find some, uh, uh, some clusters or um, no? no? Uh, no, unfortunately, I have to say that the the um, the Instagram story analysis is particularly hard to be done because we don't have any tool that is any tool to really scrape the data. Okay, so probably this I, I should have said this at the very beginning, but I'm saying it now. Um, we use the um, story saver that Alessandro also showed uh, yesterday, that is a way of scraping uh, stories. But unfortunately, you only get the story itself. And so you have to manually download them. And so what you end up with uh, is a folder of stories. Okay, and this is also why what, what we did to, to kind of uh, circumvent this this um, this problem is to was to okay the data collection uh, every time of the week I at at the same time I was collecting the the stories and at the same time creating my own Excel files stating the date the time the user and already some notes about the story that I was seeing. So if you were to analyze Instagram stories, keep in mind that it is quite a time consuming and it can be like you have to, you know, find creative ways to do to do so. Um, we also propose that if you are interested in Instagram stories, you uh, and if you uh, want to um, delve deeper into this, we also uh, we, um, Alessandro Gandini, uh, Alessandro Cagliandro and I, in our article, we also um, proposed another approach. So if you are interested in that topic specifically, you can have a read at it and yeah. And it's, it's, it's all there, yeah. Okay, um, Ali, Alicia? Yes, uh, please. I have a couple of questions. One is a more suggestion. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering how many quarters do you suggest to have when doing content and visual analysis? So in order to validate more our research. And the second question is more on how do you make categories mutually exclusive? For example, I was thinking uh, on the fact that you were like coding images, for example, uh, talking about nature, if I remember correctly, and then for example, food. But then if you have a mix of that, where a story is focused in, in an amazing place and at the same time is displaying food. Uh, how do you get to a conclusion? Because this is something that I'm struggling also with text. So I think that with images could be even worse. Yes. Um, okay, uh, starting from the last question of yours, um, the approach that uh, we used and that is usually suggested in uh, the um, uh, in the literature about visual analysis, but content analysis more broadly, I would say, is to uh, try to look for the most predominant element. So in a picture uh, that displays both uh, both the foods, uh, food and nature, what is the predominant visual element in there? And this can be done by looking at the picture. So for example, what is, what is it at, at the forefront and what is in the background? Um, I mean, and if, uh, and what is the emphasis on? And that's also why maybe uh, if we are talking about a, an Instagram picture, the text can help us doing this uh, decision because maybe we can uh, read the caption and say and see that is about, uh, oh, okay, what a lovely day in the mountains. And then uh, the, uh, the categorization would probably be uh, nature. Uh, well, if uh, instead of the caption says, oh, what an incredible sandwich I'm eating, probably it would be more about food. 
So that's also how we can, you know, uh, take both the visual and textual elements into account. Um, as for the number of coders, you say, did I understood correctly? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, there is no rule in there. Uh, it also very much depends on like the team you're working in, um, the, 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 the time you have at your disposal, uh, how the research is designed and something like that. I would, I mean, I have uh, always done um, a visual analysis by myself. But I mean, I would say that two or three, I mean, no more than three, because otherwise it would be very difficult to agree on certain categories and then interpretation is also very much subjective. And then of course you will have to do some uh, um, technicalities such as intercoder reliabilities. So some procedures to really account that all the coders are aligned uh, to, you know, to, to analyze data in the same way. So this is something that it, it can be done, it has been done, it is common practice, but yeah, it, it has some advantages and also some disadvantages. So yeah, for me, my two cents on this is no more than three. I don't know, Ilir, if you want to add something. No, I think, I mean, obviously in the context of the school, it's a bit different. So, you know, if you're in a group of five, uh, everyone should code a bit. But in general, um, I think uh, three is a good number. And also aside from, remember that if more coders are involved, as Richa mentioned, you have to talk about it. You have to say, you have to present some metrics, intercoder reliability using some specific, uh, so basically you code with the same kind of images or texts with the other coders, and then you calculate how much um, you get close to each other. Or another thing is you can go on agreement. So you can code the same piece of content, the same tweets, and you can discuss about the categories until you find and define them perfectly. But those as at least the second one in Vinity's context has to be done necessarily, I think. Thank you very much. Um, this always happens. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I'm, I see in the chat, uh, is visual uh, re uh, search free, uh, Diego? You mean the image sorter tool, right? Yeah, it is free. Uh, it is free downloadable at the, the link is also in the slide, but if you want to play around, here it is. And it's really easy to use as well. So, um, Amy raised her hand. I wanted to um, ask more about the intercoder reliability, um, specifically coding, having one person coding versus the two or three people. Is this a valid coding method? Um, and how to uh, create the, I, I guess the different ways of measuring intercoder reliability and, and making it a valid study. Thank you. Um, if I can. So the, there's a specific matrix that's called Crippendorf Alpha. That's a measure for reliability. So it's basically states um, given to, let's say uh, in, our, in, in this case, three different series of numbers, it calculates how much they match together. So let's say 70% of the things, of course it's a bit more complicated than that, but just to get an idea, 70% of this, this um, coding is the same. And usually it's, uh, there are thresholds that based, very depend based on uh, your field. I think in social sciences should be 0 0.7 or something like that as a good measure for reliability. And uh, you can find how to apply this uh, just by Googling and you can get formulas using Python, R, Excel. Uh, it's not something that you have to calculate by hand. You, you should try and uh, exploit other people that have coded the VBA Excel formula for you. I don't know if this answered your question, Amy. Yes, it, it does answer it. Uh, thank you. That was very helpful. 
the one thing is about uh, Lu Lucia had mentioned uh, she works on the stories alone. So I'm assuming that she would be coding alone. So as a single person working on research coding, um, how do you, is the research, I, I looked up how to find research um, validating that. Um, do you have any ideas? To validate the categories of the analysis, right? If there's a single coder, so you wouldn't uh, have a, an intercoder reliability then, right? There, there, there are indeed some ways of uh, accounting for um, for uh, codes of reliability. So how much your codes are really exhaustive, exclusive, and significant. Um, I have to be honest on this. Um, that is something that I didn't apply so far in my in my uh, research that I did, uh, and this is mostly because, um, I mean, the 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 idea for me was to start uh, with uh, uh, some literature and creating some uh, literature, some categories that were. Uh, in a way um, literature oriented and then using these uh, um, um, co qualitative content analysis approach to let other categories emerge. So it can be somehow a little bit difficult to, to you know, to, to, to then calculate this uh, code's reliability. Um, but this is also part of the qualitative approach. Okay, so of course, uh, in my specific case and in other cases, uh, we do we do pay attention to to the codes being as much uh, exhaustive and ex exclusive as possible, but we didn't apply any uh, metrics to validate that so far. At least so far, I don't know if. Uh, any other of the, I don't know if Alessandro Gandini or other did, but yeah, this is my. Thank you, Lucia. That was a very helpful answer. So thank you. I, I also agree with Amy. I think I wouldn't add anything to be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one more minute. So if there, um, if you have any other question, otherwise, I think that we can have lunch. And of course, if you get any question like tonight, tossing in bed, you thinking about digital content analysis, just send us an email and we'll try our best to get back to you. Absolutely. Okay. So I think that we're done for today. Thank you very much for being here and for yes. your attention. Thank you. Thank uh, you if I can only briefly uh, remind uh, the groups to self-organize for the afternoon uh, sessions using Slack or any other tool that you might have uh, used so far to communicate with each other. And uh, so, so see you there. I will now stop the recording. Bye-bye, see you. All right. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye. Bye.